All right, so once you log in, you will see some, they have just announcements uh, right here. If you don't want to see that announcement anymore, you just hit the X and the next one will show up. Courses, we are in Calculus 2, Math 152. So the main page, there are some announcements on the top. And then most of what you need is right here on the main page in terms of resources. So I already posted an announcement because this room was different than what it was in the printed schedule like four days ago. So I put an announcement up for that. Lectures, this is the YouTube playlist where you can see all the lectures. Now I haven't posted any up, so it's empty, but this is gonna get filled up with all of our lectures. So it's a good page to bookmark. You can, uh, if you subscribe to me, I think when I get 100 subscribers, I'm halfway there, I can get youtube.com slash my name. So that'll be exciting, big news, if you want to subscribe. So there's lectures. You can watch my old lectures somewhere around here. Calculus, no. Calculus 2 in the spring. Calculus 2 in the spring, there we go. So you can watch the Calculus 2 lectures from last spring. They are organized by date, not by section number, so you're gonna have to figure out, you know, if you go watch one of these, hopefully it'll be obvious what section we're in. Anyways, oh, there we go. Of natural log, which is probably one of the last things you learned when we went through exponentials on logs back in pre-calculus. So this is 7.2. So if you needed 7.6, obviously you need to jump ahead maybe four, five, six, seven lectures. So you can find stuff from last quarter. Last quarter I taught Calc 2. And you can find Calc 1 material also. So I have all of my old playlists of the old classes I've taught before. Notes. This is where you can see everything I write down in class. And one notes that program I use. It's also gonna just be an outline right now. So you can see we're gonna start in 7.1. And there's nothing in here yet. It'll fill in if you come back later after I've done uh, lecturing. So this will be the way you can get all your notes. If you missed the class and you just want the printed, the written notes, they'll be here. You can watch the video, that'll be on YouTube. Uh, I'll show you the homeworks tomorrow. Syllabus is the paper you have in your hands. So if you lose that, or if you need to access it and you're not around, uh, you wanna know when the final exam is and all you have is your phone, you can log into Canvas and look it up this way. Practice exam, these are practice problems that you don't need to know how to answer these right now but this will cover generally almost every type of problem that we're going to do in the class. And I will tell you what parts of this we're gonna cover on each midterm. So I'll tell you midterm one, we'll obviously start at question number one and maybe go up to question eight or nine, where, depending on where we stop. Midterm two, we'll start up at question eight or nine and then go to uh, some other part maybe 16, and then your final exam covers everything, not just after midterm two. And right next to each question, I write the section that it comes from. Sometimes there's more than one section that's relevant. I just tried to pick the most relevant section that it came from. So this is very useful. Discussions, you are required to participate in discussions. So if we go over to the discussions, uh-oh. I should have copied over. So apparently I don't have any discussions, so I'll add these later, and I'll show you tomorrow how to use them. Uh, if I click on grades, it shows everybody's grades. You click on grades, it shows your grades. So I'm gonna try not to click on grades in class with the recording feature turned on. Uh, people, you can look and see who your classmates are, send them a message that way if you want to. And I think that's about all we need here on Canvas. Let's go ahead and close all this up.
So we're going to start in chapter 7. We do cover chapter 6, but we're going to go we're going to go 7, 8 and then come back to 6. So even though I have all the notes available, I strongly recommend that you write down most of what I write down in class. And especially if I'm going gonna, gonna to skip more and more algebra steps the further that we go. So you're going to uh, need to write these down, especially if you want to write down the different algebra steps I skip. Sometimes I say things and don't write it down, like, oh, this is a really good quiz problem or a midterm problem. That's something you may want to write down. I may only mention it verbally. So we're going to start with inverse functions and derivatives. So let's start with the easy word, functions. So let's think about functions. We like the word, or the letter f is a good name for a function. And we think of a function. There's lots of ways to think of functions. One way to think of it is to go from the domain, domain to the range. So you can think about a function as taking numbers from the domain, or a number from the domain to a number in the range. So that's a way to think about a function. Anybody remember the one rule it takes to be a function? It's only one rule. What about one output? Yep. So, so each input, each input cannot have more than one output. How many outputs should each input have? One. So, if you have one input, you should get exactly one output. So, functions. So f takes elements in the domain. In the range. So there's one function rule. So we're going to start to write some fancy math notation. Underneath, I'll write what it means in English. So this symbol right here, that technically is an epsilon. There's two ways to write epsilons, and this is one of the ways. So that means an element in or an element from. So it just tells you the x needs to be inside the domain. Now, if you try to feed a function something that's not in the domain, that's not allowed. So you're only allowed to feed a function things from the domain. All right, so the one function rule, each x in the domain of f has exactly one y in the range of f. such that f of x equals y. So that's what it takes to be a function. So if you have a x over here, it's going to go to some y over here. So there's basics of functions. Now we're going to think about an inverse function. So inverse means opposite, or basically means to undo. So in blue, the inverse function, we write with a negative 1. It looks like a negative first power. With functions, that does not mean 1 over the function. That means the opposite function, or the function that would undo the original. Now, plenty of functions will not have an inverse. Does anybody remember the rule for when a function would have an inverse? 
Lots of functions don't have inverses. So the inverse exists exactly when the original function is 1 to 1. So what does it mean for a function to be 1 to 1? And if, when we're lazy, we just abbreviate it with 1-1 one one for 1 to 1. So what does it mean for a function to be 1 to 1? So each x has one y. So they always have to have one y, but they have their unique y. So it means the y is not shared with any other x value. So I'll write that here. f is 1, 2, 1. So underline the keyword, each x in the input has one unique output y in the domain of f. So 1 to 1 just means there's not going to be two different x values that output to one y value. So let's think about why this is important. So let's say that our original x, when we f'd it, which is how you say applying a function f to the x value, let's say it gave us two outputs, then f would not be a function. So if one input went to two outputs, f would not be a function. So that rule obviously can't happen. However, let's say Bit of green. So let's say our x went to y, but there was some other x naught that also outputted to y. That's completely okay. Maybe we have a square function and our input is 1 and negative 1. They both outputs positive 1. It's a completely okay function. The problem is when we go to turn the arrows backwards, what happens when we turn the arrows around? For the inverse function, we have this y value now outputs back to two locations. So that's why you have to have a one-to-one -one function if you're going to turn it the opposite direction. So for that reason, we have to make sure our functions are one-to-one -one if we're going to write down their inverses. So if you have one-to-one -one function, you don't have the problem of two inputs going to the same output. You'll be able to turn it around. There is an algebraic test for one-to-one. -one. Let me write, I'll write it the other way. Any So take any x1 and x2 in the domain of f. If f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 has to equal x2. So that's how you check if you're one to one. So if you can take any two inputs, if they have the same output, then they'd have to have be the same exact input. So an easy function is the x squared function. So our first example is show. Show this is not one to one. So you can either use the uh, algebraic test right here. So suppose fx1 equals f of x2, which means x1. Now we're going to have a little problem if we write x1 squared. It's a little weird with a superscript subscript. So 
to be a little extra careful. So that means x1 squared equals x2 squared. Does that let me conclude x1 equals x2? What's the other conclusion? So two numbers squared are equal. What can you tell me about the numbers? They're either the same number or? Yeah, or they could be negatives of each other. So they're e either equal or x1 equals negative x2. So they're either the exact same number or they're opposite signs. This is the reason that you can't just say the square function is 1 to 1. So it could be uh, opposite signs. So that's why it's going to fail the 1 to 1 test. You can also just pick two x values, negative 1 and positive 1, and say, hey, look, they both go to 1. So I just found two x values that go to the same y value. So that's another way to show it. Uh, we can also, if you have a graph, you can do a horizontal line test. That's another option. So if you have a graph of the function, you can look at the horizontal line test and see, is there only uh, one place where the horizontal line touches that graph? Uh, we're not going to get too into graphing, so I don't want to focus at all on the horizontal line test. So the algebraic way is going to be, if you have to check, do it the algebraic way. All right, now we're going to test your calculus skills. Actually, before we do an example, let's see. What rule do I need to find this derivative? So this is going to be our chain rule right here. So the chain rule is f prime of regular g of x times g prime of x. So I'm going to tell you something that's both good and bad. You get to make your own cheat sheet this quarter. So before you think that that's great, I mean, it is great because you don't have to remember everything. But the reason I let you do it in Calc 2 and I didn't let you do it in Calc 1 is because there's a monumental number of things to know in Calculus 2. So if you forgot the chain rule, that can be the first thing that goes on your cheat sheet. I don't put any restrictions on what goes on your cheat sheet. If you're really bad at trig, maybe a quarter of your sheet's filled up with trigonometry, unit circle, things like this. Uh, maybe you did really bad in algebra and you need a little refresher on fractions or something like that. That might need to go on your cheat sheet. Uh, calculus 1 stuff that you had trouble with definitely should go on your cheat sheet. So you might need chain rule for a little while and then at some point you can erase it and make space for other stuff. So your cheat sheet is a regular piece of paper, 8.5 by 11. I recommend use something a little heavier like a really good printer paper or something like that, or you can even cut uh, a manila folder up because that'll let you erase like 12 times without putting a hole in your paper. If you use the notebook paper, you'll put a hole in your paper pretty quickly after like the third or fourth time you start erasing. So use a cheat sheet and use something relatively thick. Yes, sir? Yeah, you can use both sides. Yeah, I don't care if it's graph paper, line paper, just the size is important. I don't want you coming in with like a poster like rolled up under your arm. It's, it does have to be the standard, standard size. So I, I mean, a really good choice is basically cut a manila folder up into a, the right size and use that. It'll also give you a nice straight edge, too, when you need to draw a nice graph with the, if you're one of the perfectionists who needs straight edges on graphs, it'll let you draw those as well. All right, so there's a chain rule. A lot of times I'll put a bubble around stuff I expect you to know already, and then new stuff I put a box around it. So if there's a bubble around it, it should already be in your brain.
So we're going to find f inverse of x. And we're going to find it by taking the derivative of f of f inverse of x. Now before we do any calculus, what does this inside reduce to? f of f inverse of x. What is the algebraic property of inverse functions? If you apply f inverse and then you f it. Nope, so you're thinking of reciprocals. So this function f inverse undoes what f is going to do. All right, let's think about up here. So f is going to take this over to here. What will I get when I apply f inverse? f inverse is going to go the exact same place, just go back. So if you apply f inverse and then f, you're going to start back at the beginning where you started. Maybe I should write those two down. So algebraic properties, f of f inverse of x equals x, and f inverse of f of x equals x. So the inverse function cancels out the original f, and it works in either order. It doesn't matter which of the two orders. So what that means down here, f of f inverse of x is the same as just x itself. So I want to apply derivative to both sides. I'll do the easy side, the right side. Derivative of x is 1. All right, so start out with an easy derivative. Now I need the chain rule on the left side. So the way we're going to write it, it's going to be f prime of f inverse of x. So that's a derivative of the outside with the input as the inside, multiplied by, now I'm going to write some really bad notation. You feel free to copy this down. This is supposed to be the inverse derivative of x. So obviously the inverse and the derivative look almost identical. So this is really a bad way to write this down. If you really have to write it, you could use parentheses to kind of sort it out. Now, obviously, that's a bad way to write it. So let's leave the ddx f inverse of x. So let's leave it written like this right here. So it doesn't look like prime with a negative 1 right next to it. So what I'm going to do is solve for the derivative of f inverse. So I'm going to divide by what's on the left. And this is the derivative of the inverse function, or the inverse derivative. So this is the first new thing from this quarter. And we do an example problem. I'm going to write ex underline, and that's an example problem. So that's going to be similar to what I could give you on homework, quiz, midterm. Uh, we're running out of time, so I will do the example problem tomorrow. So are there any questions before I let you go?